Lord be with you. We welcome you today to Zion, another a joyful day to gather. As always, there are a lot of things happening. So let me walk you through what today is going to look like and then throughout the week. So today, in terms of our liturgical calendar, you can see red. We are on the festival of Pentecost, and you'll see that emphasized in the readings and the liturgy today. It's also graduation Sunday for our high schoolers. In just a minute, I'm going to walk in with them and welcome them for uh, uh, worship. But we're going to be honoring them. We had breakfast with them this morning, so we thank the ladies for making breakfast for them. But we'll welcome them up a little bit later during the service as we honor them and celebrate this milestone in their life. After worship, you have the opportunity to give uh, your second quarterly door offering for our missionary, Professor Oliver, in Taiwan. So those are some of the things happening today. While I finish my announcements, Catherine, where did you end? Oh, you've got your mic ready to go. Come on up and share yours before I continue with the next ones of mine. Okay, two quick announcements. Vacation Bible School is coming up. You can still register your children online, or there are some forms out in the hall. Um, also, we are need, in need of more volunteers, so if you would like to volunteer your time, and even if you can only give us one day, we'll take you for whatever amount of time you're able to give. We will also take lots of cookie donations for snacks, so feel free to make cookies, bring them to our new church office uptown. Here, we'll take cookies. Lastly, uh, we are kicking off our summer reading challenge next week, or two weeks from now in June. So if you want to read through the New Testament with us, there are some flyers out on the fellowship hall for the new summer reading program challenge as well. Thank you, thank you. Okay, also a reminder, the Memorial Day lunch is coming up. If you would like to volunteer or donate for that, that information is in the fellowship hall. Also, uh, a Lutheran family service, which I participate with in uh, uh, an itinerant fashion and a part-time fashion. I assist them with some of their teaching, and I'm helping with some of their webinar series they're putting on. The information is there for you in your worship folder. Should you wish to log on live this Thursday at 7, or if you would like to watch it recorded, uh, you can get that as well. You need to register. It's free, but it's an excellent seminar, or I should say webinar, on identity and respond, responding to the sexualization of identity that you see in our culture. Okay, a couple more things that I have to share. Uh, some of you have received a text message purportedly from me asking you for gift cards. I will not do that. That is not from me. Okay? If you get a text saying it's from Pastor Connor or Jonathan Connor and I'm, I'm, I'm really busy right now and I, I just need a gift card, that is not me. Okay, I, someone's impersonating me, and just ignore them. They do the same thing to our district president. I get emails periodically from our district, from our district president asking for iTunes gift cards. And he has to ask it. every time say, I don't even know how to work an iTunes gift card. I will not be asking you for iTunes gift card. So just please share that. Do not give them money. Do not give them a gift card. If you want to give me a gift card, oh, that's fine. I'll, I'll take the gift card. But I will not be texting you asking for a gift card. Second, uh, Catherine made reference to this, but our offices, the 
So Catherine's office, my office, and Shannon's office are now on, well, technically 3rd Street, on the Main Street, right across the street from Templeton Savings Bank, the old, old home mutual building. They are there temporarily because after VBS, the work under the roof has to begin, and that basically means our offices are going to be gutted and redone uh, to repair from the water damage. So if you're looking for us and you walk in the building and you say, why is it so quiet here during the week? Where are they? That's where we are. Same phone number, same emails, different address, but also same friendly people. So that's where you'll find us if you can't find us here. Okay, my last item. Most of you know that I have received a call to serve as pastor at Beautiful Savior Lutheran Church in Mequon, Wisconsin. I shared with them this week that I've declined that call, and I'll be remaining at Zion. Now, I want to share with you just a couple reasons why I declined that call. Now, it's a, it's a fine church, it's a, it's a, and you should celebrate. You have a sister congregation there doing great ministry. But the reasons I declined has to do with you, and uh, that's lots of reasons, but two primary, and one of them has to do exactly with what we're doing this morning, uh, the way we do family together. It's very meaningful to me personally and to our family, and I hope it's meaningful for yours, that what, what happens here something pretty special. And that's very meaningful to me and to my family. So thank you. And number two, and you've been very supportive of this, I mentioned my partnership with Lutheran Family Service, but I, I, I get invited by the district a variety of times and in capacities to do a lot of teaching around our district. And I know as a teaching pastor, I'm a little bit of an odd duck. I get that. Uh, but my observation is this. Where that call was, they are very close to Concordia, Wisconsin, which is a great teaching opportunity. I would have had opportunity to teach at the college, which is something I think most of you know me would say, Pastor Connor would like that, and I would. But I thought about this, and if you lived in Mequon and you wanted to go to a workshop or a seminar or hear a high-level teaching or a theologian, they, they've got dozens of them. There are lots of opportunities for that sort of teaching in that area. We don't have lots of those opportunities in this area. And I feel like that's part of my call, and you've been supportive of that, is to bring that teaching here and to be utilized both here at Zion, but you've been supportive of allowing me in limited capacity to go to other areas in our district to bring that teaching there as well. So I thank you for supporting me in that, but I see that as a valuable piece of the ministry we do here at Zion. We're very intentional about that, that teaching that is aimed at deep theological teaching, really digging into the scriptures and trying to apply that to all areas of our life. So those would be some of the main reasons for why I declined that call, but that's because I feel like God is working in some important ways here at Zion, and I'm excited to be a part of that. Okay, I know, long announcements, I apologize, but that's because there's so many things happening at Zion uh, that uh, this takes that long. Now here's what I'm going to do. Praise team, I'm going to turn it over to you, but I'm going to walk back and join our graduates once I get back there and you see me start to come in, you guys just go ahead and get started. Uh, once you see me come in with them, stand up out of honor for our graduates and then we'll get going. So praise team. Spoken, rest beside these living waters. 
we hit our invocation to our graduates, I want you to observe something. They stood up for you. I told you before church that Jesus loves you and Zion cares for you. And I never want you to forget that. They stood up for you because they care about you. They celebrate what you're doing today. Return to our invocation. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father, merciful Lord. You despise nothing you have made, and you desire not the death of sinners. We confess that we have abused your blessings, neglected our neighbors, and served only ourselves. Our sin, within and without, known and unknown, has made us and our world unrighteous altogether. Mercifully turn us from temptation and transgression to lament our frailties, repent our failures, and amend our behavior. Graciously take away our guilt and punishment for the sake of Jesus Christ, our substitute and advocate. Grant that his atonement for iniquity and dominion over death reconcile us in holy faithfulness to you and humble fellowship with one another. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of the faithful and kindle in them the fire of your love. Alleluia. O Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom have you made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. These all look to you to give them their food in due season. When you give it to them, they gather it up. When you open your hand, they are filled with good things. When you send forth your spirit, they are created, and you renew the face of the ground. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of the faithful and kindle in them the fire of your love. Alleluia. May be seated. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. O God, the Father in heaven, have mercy upon us. O God, the Son, Redeemer of the world, have mercy on us. O God, the Holy Spirit, true comforter, have mercy upon us. Lord God, the Holy Spirit, you are the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, and you are the spirit of the knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Have mercy upon us. Lord God, the Holy Spirit, you are the spirit of love, the spirit of joy, the spirit of patience, kindness, and goodness, and you are the spirit of faith, humility, and chastity. Have mercy upon us, O Holy Spirit. You are he who tests the hearts of mankind and reigns, and you are the dispenser of heavenly grace have mercy upon us. Lord God, the Holy Spirit, you are the joy of the angels, the comfort of the sorrowing, the light of the prophets, and you are the wisdom of the apostles. Have mercy upon us, O Holy Spirit. You are the victory of the holy martyrs, and you are the anointing of the saints. Have mercy upon us. Be gracious unto us. Spare us, good Lord. Be gracious unto us. Help us, good Lord from the crafts and assaults of the devil, from heresy and deceitful teaching, from envy and ill will to the brethren, from impurity of body and soul, from indifference in the service of God and from all evil spirits, deliver us, good Lord. Lord God, the Holy Spirit, you who eternally proceeds from the Father and the Son, you who did overshadow the blessed virgin, causing her to conceive in her womb the eternal Son of God, Jesus the Christ, you who did descend upon the Son of God in the form of a dove, 
you who were poured out upon the holy apostles, descending upon them in tongues of flame, enabling them to speak the gospel in other languages, you who have re regenerated us in holy baptism, and you who dwell in us through your word and sacrament, help us, good Lord. O Holy Spirit, you intercede for us in groanings that cannot be uttered. Hear us, good Lord. Lord God, the Holy Spirit, we poor sinners beseech you to hear us, good Lord and to cleanse and sanctify all the members of your holy church, to adorn the bride of Christ with manifold gifts, to bless and protect our synod together with all its ministers and institutions, to grant us all the spirit of prayer and reverent worship, to govern and sanctify our thoughts, words, and deeds, to adorn our lives with patience and humility, to kindle in us love and mercy, to clothe us with chastity, to work in us the peace of God, to keep us in your grace and to bring us to everlasting life. We beseech you to hear us, good Lord. Lord God, the Holy Spirit, have mercy upon us. Lord God, Son of the Father, have mercy upon us. O Christ, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy upon us. O Christ, the Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy upon us. O Christ, the Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Grant us your peace. O Christ, hear us. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray together. O God, on this day, you once taught the hearts of your faithful people by sending them the light of your Holy Spirit. Grant us in our day, by the same Spirit, to have a right understanding in all things, and evermore to rejoice in his holy consolation. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Old Testament reading is from Ezekiel chapter 37, uh, commonly referred to as Ezekiel's vision of the dry bones. Let me make one thing clear on this so you're not confused. Here's the idea. Israel is in exile. Now, I know it's hard for us to process what that means, but if you were forcibly uprooted from your home and taken to a different country and made to be slaves and live under their rule, then you'd start to get the idea of what it means to be in exile, to, to, to be homesick every day. 
and have no assurance that you're ever going home. The Lord sends Ezekiel to bring a word of hope that they will get to go home. So this vision is a vision. And it's a vision of these dry bones being brought back to life. But the message is, this is the promise for you, Israel. You feel like a valley of dry bones. But there's a resurrection coming for you, a return home coming for you. The Lord is at work. We begin with verse number one. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. And he led me around among them. And behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley. And behold, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live. And you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a sound, and behold, a rattling And the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked, and behold, there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and the skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me. And the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are clean cut off. Therefore, prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord. When I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you in your own land, Then you shall know that I am the Lord. I have spoken, and I will do it, declares the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Okay, very quickly before we move to the next uh, piece. There's a word in there. You heard the word wind and spirit and breath. Three different words in English. The same word in Hebrew. Ruach, which is a great word, right? How fun to say that. Ruach, spirit, wind, breath. So when he's prophesying to the ruach, the breath, the spirit, the the wind, it's all tied in together. This idea of the breath of God, the spirit of God animating these people. So those words are all connected. Ruach, spirit, wind, breath. Now, what's going to come up on the screen in just a second. I put together, and you probably have seen this last year, but a a short little video I put together a couple years ago on Pentecost. Now, This is, I'm not even at the level of amateur. Okay, so give me some grace here when you watch this video. Uh, This was during the COVID years, and I was learning. But it does encapsulate in about five minutes what Pentecost is about, because I'm going to be preaching on the gospel text and not the Acts text. So you're going to watch the video, then we'll read the the Pentecost text. Let's see if it works. we got the PC volume on. So I'm waving my hands here. Are you ready? (laughs) Okay, let's get to it. Perfect. (laughs) Let's talk about Pentecost. The Bible tells the story in Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. 
and divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And a crowd of people came running. They were from all over the world and spoke different languages, but they could hear their language being spoken because God's Spirit was giving the apostles of Jesus the power to speak in those languages. And they said, We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And they asked, what does it mean? The Apostle Peter stood up and said, This is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Now these are really important words. Peter used the words last days. What does he mean? Well, think GPS, but not global positioning system. Think God's positioning story. Pentecost is God's positioning story. It tells us where we live in God's story. So there was creation and then the fall of Adam, the flood, Moses and Israel, David, Solomon, and all the kings and prophets, the exile in Babylon, and then a whole lot of other really exciting stories with guys like Ezekiel and Daniel and Ezra and Nehemiah and Zerubbabel. And then John the Baptist and Jesus, and his whole story of death and resurrection, and then Pentecost. But it's more than that. Ever since the sin of Adam, the world has been scarred by sin and evil and suffering and death. So our timeline should look like this. It's a story scarred by sad and bad things. It's a story where people get sick and die, where people hurt people, where people are mean and selfish and angry, where people lie and cheat and steal. It's a story with things like pandemics. But Pentecost is the great big announcement of God that he has started a new story, a new time. It's a story he's been preparing for since before the first story went bad. In this story, we have forgiveness and life in Jesus. In this story, God changes our hearts by filling us with his spirit. In this story, he baptizes us and feeds us forgiveness and holy communion. In this story, we have the big promise of God that he's going to make the earth new and fresh again. That's why Pentecost is such a big deal. That's why Peter is so excited. The new story is beginning. And when Jesus comes back, this is going to be the story that goes on forever. So the old sin story of bad and sad things will stick around for a while until Jesus returns. But the new story has started. That's where we're living. That's where we are in God's salvation story. That's the big announcement of Pentecost. So remember this, when Jesus returns, the old sin story is going to vanish forever. And the new story of life and joy and happiness will be the only story left and it will shine with the wow of God. This is the good news of Pentecost. God has started this story and his Holy Spirit lives and works in our lives in this story, forgiving our sins and making us new as we look for and plan for and dream about the day when Jesus returns to bring this story to the place God is taking it, to the resurrection of our bodies and the renewal of the whole earth where everything is happy and good forever. You are a part of this story and you're going to enjoy it forever. Okay, wasn't that an exciting story? And we just scratched the surface. There's so much more to Pentecost and to the Bible for that matter. So make sure you're in church to hear the true stories of the Bible. And then check out our website, zionmanning.com, and our app where you can find more videos like this one. Thanks for watching. Okay, super amateur, I know but it at least gives you an idea in a, in a visual way what the significance of Pentecost is. So we read the Pentecost, or portion of the Pentecost text. It goes on for quite a ways after we stop. But we'll read the first portion this week. Acts chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. 
When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, they were dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together, and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? How is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya, belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does it mean? But others, mocking, said, They are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these men are not drunk as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, declares God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite you to stand. We say together, Alleluia, come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of the faithful and kindle in them the fire of your love. Alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 15th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. We begin with verse number 26. Just Jesus is speaking here. But when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. And you also will bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning. We skip down to verse 4. I did not say these things to you from the beginning, because I was with you. But now I am going to him who sent me. And none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father, and you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Congregation, you may be seated. Graduates, you're going to come right up here and stand on the top step and face the congregation, please. I've already said to you, congratulations. And 
they are saying that by their presence and by their standing, they are congratulating you. I want to share your confirmation verse or one of your favorite verses that you have shared and speak a little bit about why these verses, I pray, would plant themselves in your heart and truly go with you. So, Lane, one of your favorite verses that you have shared is from 1 Timothy 4, verse 8. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. Lane, I think this is a great verse. Uh, you know a little bit about bodily training. I've seen you work at football and cross country, and uh, that takes a little bit of training, doesn't it? You have to push your body to its limit, and I think you know what that means to work hard in that way, and that's a good thing. I know many of us have enjoyed cheering you on in those, those avenues and those, those uh, efforts. But what this verse is saying is that has value. It is good. But godliness holds value beyond that, both for this life and for the life to come. Don't overlook the fact that Paul is talking about the life to come. It's too easy sometimes in our life to be fixated on the, this life, which is important. But there's a life to come. And I pray that God takes this verse and he plants it in your heart, Lane, and you realize, hey, I can push my body in some impressive ways, and this is a good gift that God gives me. It's a good thing. But godliness, that has rewards both now and into eternity. So we commend you for this verse, and uh, pray I commend it to you as a verse for, for contempl contemplation and for celebration. Aaron, your confirmation verse from Deuteronomy chapter 31. If, the Lord who goes if it is the Lord who goes before you, he will be with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. That's a great verse. So you have Israel going through the wilderness, right? And the Lord goes before them and leads them. He hasn't stopped going before you, right? He continues to lead you. And that's good because he's actually a better leader than we are. Um, I want to share something if this applies. Pastor Johnson used to talk about this. He used to talk about the valley of the shadow of death, which for him was a very real thing. But he said he wasn't afraid of it because the Lord went before him and he knew the way through. There are going to be times in your life when you don't know the way forward. Adults, is that true? There are going to be times in your life you don't know how you're going to go on. You don't know how it's going to work. That's not something to be afraid of. That's part of life in a fallen world. But you have a Lord who goes before you in your Lord Jesus Christ, and I pray you follow him your whole life long. Brooke, your confirmation verse from Isaiah chapter 43, verse 1. But now thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you, I have called you by name, you are mine. So God speaks to this to the people of Israel. He says, I've called you by name. He gets a little bit more personal in Jesus. He calls you by name, Brooke. The God of creation knows your name. I sometimes forget my kids' names. Your God knows your name. Never forget that. He gets very personal with you in Jesus, and he's redeemed you by shedding his blood for you. And when you get that for you-ness in your heart, I mean, when, it, when you get in there and you say, this is not a generic thing, this is a for me thing, well, that's going to fill you up with so much joy and confidence in your life that no matter what uncertainties might come, and there will be those, that you know that deep in your heart, that will go with you, Brooke. I pray you take it your whole life long. Haley, your cho chosen confirmation verse was Ephesians chapter 2, 8 through 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Not a result of works so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now, Haley, my guess is you have or you will be receiving some graduation gifts, right? All of you, in some capacity. Um, you have your parties, and there's a basket full of cards, and there are gifts. Those are lots of fun. 
Those are wonderful gifts. I pray you celebrate every one of them, but not one of them is as good as the gift that God gives to you in Jesus. He gives you everlasting life. Anybody here able to give that gift? Anybody put that in an envelope when you went to a graduation party? Just sticking everlasting life in there and giving it to the graduates. We can't give that gift, Haley, but Jesus does. You didn't have to earn it. You don't have to be good enough. You don't have to be pretty enough. You don't have to be smart enough. You don't have to be tall enough. You don't have to be fast enough. You don't have to do anything enough to get that. You have to do certain things to graduate. There's a certain threshold you've got to meet. You've got to earn it. But not this gift. You don't have to earn it. He gives it. And he continues to refresh that gift and renew that gift in his church over and over again. See, the church is about actually giving you gifts every time you come here. Sometimes we like to think it's about us, oh, I have to go to church today. Um, actually, no, Jesus comes to church to give you his gifts of eternal life. That makes the church pretty unique, doesn't it? When you come here, the giver is actually not you. It's Jesus. Tyler, your confirmation verse was from Psalm 37, verse 5. Commit your way to the Lord, trust in him, and he will act. Commit your way to the Lord, Tyler, right? You commit yourself to a lot of things in life, right? To work to academics, to friends, to lots of things. And these are good things, right? Commit your way to the Lord. Why? Because he's committed his way to you. If you ever doubt that, you return to that cross and you say, he did that for me. He's baptized you. He feeds you with the Lord's Supper. He's committed his way to you. Commit your way to him. Follow him. Trust him. He will act. Ross, your verse from Isaiah 41.10. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Ross, I want you to notice something. Who was the one controlling the verbs in that verse? It's God. He will do it. He does it through his word. He puts that word into your heart and to your mind often talk about it as trenching a reservoir of faith. You're going to trench it as deep as you can, and you're going to fill it with that word of God. Because, Ross, you know this. There are hard things that happen in life. There are things you can't predict, and there are hard things that you, will, you have experienced and you will experience. You know that. And if that reservoir is empty, there's nothing there to minister to you. What we're doing here, Ross, and I pray you stay connected to the church, is we're helping you and every single one of you trench that reservoir. Because the dry times do come, don't they? They come. When that's filled up with God's word, it's going to fill you up, Ross. I pray for you that, that that word does that. Now, there are other names on here. Some are not with us today. One of them is in heaven. And we remember your classmate. We remember Max. Our hearts have grief in them, but he's with Jesus. He's with Jesus. He appreciated Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Now, that verse is not about being able to climb mountains or to you know, be the best long jumper or score the most, most touchdowns. It's not what it's about. If you read it in context, he says, I in plenty and in want and in, in hard times and in good times, I can do all things. The hard times come, guys. But Jesus doesn't go away. He will strengthen you with his promises. His promises are rock solid. Things in this life, not so much. Right? Not so much. But the promises of Jesus, they don't go away. Now, you guys are each going to go from this place and go different places. But our prayer is that promise lives in your heart. And I want you to see this congregation. I said it earlier. I'm going to close with this. I'll say it again. Jesus loves you, and Zion cares for you. Can we show our congratulations? Okay, you guys can have a seat. Thank you, guys. Praise team, lead us in our next song, please.
Grace to you from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. God speaks to us today in our gospel reading from John chapter 16. And let me offer this. Got some teaching to do today. So we're going to shift gears. We're going to teach what Jesus is talking about here in John 16, important things about the Holy Spirit. So journey along with me. It's going to take me a few minutes. But there are important things in this text. You can see the title on the screen, When the Spirit Comes. Twice in this section, Jesus says, when the Spirit comes, he will. We're going to see how Jesus finishes those sentences. And in so doing, we will gain a better appreciation for the work of the Holy Spirit. And I want to say up front, this is important. People go strange places with the Spirit today. And today's text will help us stay true to Scripture and the Spirit. Let me give you a hint. The Spirit is focused on Jesus. Okay, let's get to it. Twice Jesus is going to say, when the Spirit comes, He will. The first time Jesus is describing what we might call the negative work of the Spirit, which I'll explain in just a minute, and as you might guess, the second time Jesus describes what we might call the positive work of the Spirit. Let me show you what I mean. Jesus says to his disciples, and when the Holy Spirit comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. Okay, so this is what we're going to call the negative work of the Holy Spirit. Or we could call it the convicting work of the Holy Spirit. Jesus says that the Holy Spirit is going to convict the world. Now, the connotation here has to do with exposing, with bringing to light so that everything is made plain. And the Spirit is going to expose the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. And Jesus details how the Spirit will do that. Now, obviously, this is going to take us a little bit of work to get through, but if we're going to be biblical Christians, and I might add spiritual Christians, it's work we got to do. We're going to walk through Jesus' words one phrase at a time. But remember, this first, first time we're talking about this, it's the negative work of the Spirit. It's going to feel a little harsh for a few minutes. I know that this doesn't play well in an affirmation-only world, but we need to remember that God's Spirit is not a squishmallow. Jesus calls him the Spirit of truth, and truth, like a knife, is pointed. Do you appreciate the point? Truth divides truth from false. It cuts, it severs, it cleaves. So you can expect the Spirit to divide true from false. Now, let me add something here. This doesn't give us the right to be pointed. Because remember, we are not the truth. The Spirit is. He gets to be pointed. He convicts. Our job is simply to confess the truth, not to stab people with it. Yes, in confessing the truth, people may encounter the pointed edge of the Spirit, but for our purposes right now, we need to remember that we are not the pointed edge of truth. Okay, so Jesus begins with sin. He says, the Holy Spirit will convict or expose the world concerning sin because they do not believe in me. Well, what's Jesus talking about? Well, what is at the root of all sin? Unbelief. So what's Jesus saying? He's saying that the world rejects him. Now right away, we need to do a little bit of teaching here because there's this popular notion among us that most people are Christian, at least in our little towns. Yes, people may think of themselves as Christian, but many people, in fact, I would venture to say most people think of themselves also as good people. (laughs) We know what the scriptures say to this. 
None is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they've become worthless. No one does good. Not even one. Now, when it comes to those with faith in Christ, I realize that the ultimate judgment is done by Jesus. See, he knows we do not see people's hearts. but We do see their faith. We do see their fruit of their faith, I should say. We don't see their faith, we do see the fruit. So isn't it reasonable to conclude that Christians will worship Jesus with the church that Jesus founded? Wouldn't that be reasonable? Isn't it reasonable to conclude that Christians will practice what Jesus preached, right? Repentance. Isn't that what Jesus preached? Isn't it reasonable to conclude that Christians will receive the sacrament that Jesus commanded us to receive? Isn't it reasonable to conclude that, that Christians will abstain from open shows of sin, like, you know, living with your boyfriend or girlfriend, or from affirming sexual identities that deny the pattern stamped onto the body, from outbursts of anger and foul language, from sexual immorality, from music that undermines the truth of God's Word. I mean, isn't that reasonable? Isn't it reasonable to conclude that a Christian will demonstrate believing loyalty to Jesus Christ and that those who don't aren't Christian, even if it's culturally expedient to say they are Christian? Jesus says the Spirit will convict. He will expose the world concerning sin because they do not believe in Him. He's going to pull back the covers and reveal the truth. I'm going to say this kindly, although bluntly, but there are going to be some surprises when He pulls that cover back. Jesus says the Holy Spirit will convict or expose the world concerning righteousness because I go to the Father. Okay, now, how does Jesus' going to the Father convict or expose the world concerning righteousness? What's he mean? Well, remember what righteousness means, right? If something is righteous, it's working the way it's designed to work. So remember some of our examples we've used before. So if your tractor is righteous, it hums along smoothly, it doesn't break down. If your computer is righteous, it speeds along without locking up or needing to be restarted. If your relationship with your husband or wife is righteous, you buzz along in harmony. If your relationship with God is righteous, you've been reconciled to God and you're in a saving relationship with Him. So Jesus says the Holy Spirit's going to convict the world concerning righteousness. In other words, He's going to expose them for getting this wrong. And it's somehow connected to Jesus' going to the Father. So think about Jesus' earthly ministry. What did the world, that is those who rejected Jesus, what did they say about Jesus? Well, they accused him of being an unrighteous, demon-possessed, mentally unstable sinner who was not from God. In other words, they rejected him as the righteous one sent from God to save them. Now, I know it's really tempting to think, well, nobody thinks that today. Now, it may be that very few people have the guts to say that today, but that doesn't mean they are confessing Jesus as the righteous one from God, the one with the right relationship with God who can restore us to the Father and make our relationship with Him right. They may think that Jesus was a swell guy, that He had some nice things to say, and that He he even loved everyone, even though we largely don't understand what that word love means today, but they mostly don't see him. They don't see that without him, they are lost and condemned forever. Please appreciate that point. Apart from Jesus, there is no salvation. Apart from the atoning work of Jesus Christ, there is no forgiveness. Thinking Jesus is a swell guy won't help you. And thinking you are a swell guy or gal won't help you. Remember what we said earlier, that many people think that they're basically good. And we all think, well, good people are automatically saved. 
but just do a little thought experiment, experiment with me. Okay, play along for a minute. You can just nod in your heads. Have you ever told a lie? If you're saying no, you're lying. Well, what do you call people who tell lies? You call them a liar, right? Have you ever taken something, anything, that wasn't yours? What do you call people who take things that aren't theirs? You call them thieves, right? Have you ever used God's name in a way that dishonored him? Ever. What do you call this person? Well, you, according to the scriptures, you call them a blasphemer. Have you ever wished ill on someone? Just even in your heart. What do you call this person? At least according to Jesus, a murderer. So, by your own admission, you are a lying, thieving, blasphemous murderer. Further, all your sins have been committed against an eternal God. As such, they bring an eternal punishment. This is true for every person on the planet. Any claim to be a good person is meaningless. It's like claiming, well... You know, all of my neighbors are jerks, Your Honor, but I only murdered one of them. My good outweighs my bad. No judge would buy that. And you think that God is going to be convinced by some empty claim to human goodness? Jesus says the Spirit will convict the world concerning righteousness because Jesus is returning to the Father. In other words, Jesus, the righteous one, is returning to the Father. Those of you who are refusing to yield your life to him are rejecting the righteous one, the one who makes you righteous before the Father. And that puts your eternal salvation in grave danger. Jesus says, the Holy Spirit will convict or expose the world concerning judgment because the ruler of the world is judged. Let's unpack that. So you know that the ruler of this world is Jesus' way of referring to Satan. And Jesus is saying that the Holy Spirit is going to expose the world for backing the wrong guy. So it's like saying, your guy lost. The guy you bet against won. You're on the wrong side. The cross didn't turn out to be God's judgment on Jesus, but God's judgment on Satan. The cross didn't turn out to be Jesus' defeat. It was Satan's defeat. The ruler of this world stands condemned. Jesus is vindicated. Satan's defeat proves that Jesus is who he said he is. He is the Son of God who has come to inaugurate the kingdom of God. Now, let me very quickly summarize what we've talked about so far. The Holy Spirit is sent by Jesus to prosecute the case against the world by exposing its unbelief, which is the essence of sin, by showing that its verdict on Jesus was wrong because Jesus returned to the Father in his ascension and exaltation, and by showing that the ruler of the world, Satan, who engineered Jesus' death and who continues to oppose him, stands condemned because Jesus has risen victoriously from the dead. This is a part of the Holy Spirit's job description. The Holy Spirit convicts the world of getting Jesus wrong. Like we said, He's not a squishmallow. He is the spirit of truth, and the truth is pointed. Okay, so that's what we might call the negative work of the spirit, the convicting work of the spirit. We also mentioned the positive work of the Holy Spirit. Jesus says this, I still have many things to say to you. I do too. Anyway, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine, therefore I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. It's going to take me a little bit of time, just a little bit, but bear with me. Listen very carefully. Jesus here moves from the negative work, the Spirit, right, convicting the world, to the positive role of the Spirit, guiding believers into the truth and glorifying Jesus. So Jesus says the Spirit will guide the disciples and all of us into the truth. How can he do that? 
Because he's going to speak what he hears from Jesus, who is truth in the flesh. Now, this is really important to appreciate. The Holy Spirit does not act separately from the word he hears from Jesus. Now, we have that word of Jesus recorded in the Bible. We have the word of Jesus connected to the sacraments. We have the word of Jesus present in our preaching of God's word. God's spirit is at work here, and he does not act separately from Jesus' word. So please appreciate that point. If you want to know where God's spirit is working, where the Holy Spirit is working, you need to ask where the word of God is being heard. That's where the spirit works. This is so important to appreciate because you've got a whole horde of preachers today, even churches, who constantly separate the Spirit from the Word of Jesus. They run after signs and wonders of the Spirit, but they never seem to find Jesus. But, but showing Jesus was specifically the reason that Jesus sent the Spirit. So you've got to be really wary of any church or any preacher who says, God's Spirit is doing a new thing, or the Holy Spirit gave me a special revelation, or the Holy Spirit gave me a special insight into something that nobody else knew before. God's Spirit told me, but they have no biblical text or promise of God. If a church or a person is always talking about the wonders of the Holy Spirit, and never seems to get around to Jesus, to the crucified for sin, risen for life, Jesus, they're not talking about the Holy Spirit. Jesus makes the work of the Spirit plain. He is going to guide Christ's followers into truth. He's going to speak what he hears from Jesus. He's going to declare the things that are to come, and he's going to glorify Jesus. This is his positive work. And there's a lot there, all right? We only have time just to scratch the surface for our last couple minutes. Okay, he is guiding into the truth and is clearly connected to speaking what he hears from Jesus. So again, we can see how connected the Spirit and Jesus are and how truth is found in Jesus through the working of the Spirit. Now, what are the things that are to come? Well, given the big picture context of Jesus' words, right, his promises in the Holy Spirit at Pentecost and the truths the Spirit reveals at Pentecost, it seems that the things that are to come are, big word, eschatological in nature. It has to do with end times. So the Spirit's going to reveal the things of the end times, which is what we see him doing throughout the rest of Scripture. He reveals and highlights the victory of Jesus Christ over sin, death, and Satan. So, Jesus says the Holy Spirit will glorify him by taking what is Jesus's and declaring it to us. Now, what is Jesus's? What? The victory over sin, death, and the devil. The gospel of God. The resurrection. The renewal of all things. That's what belongs to Jesus. And the Spirit is going to glorify Jesus by declaring those things to you. So again, the Spirit's going to keep us grounded in Jesus and in the things that belong to Jesus. And This is the best news ever. Now, I know we've covered a lot. The negative work or convicting work of the Spirit, the positive or guiding and glorifying work of the Spirit, and all of it, all of it is focused on Jesus, on Jesus Christ, crucified for sin and risen for life, for your sin, for your life. When the Spirit comes, which he has done in Pentecost, which he continues to do today in the preached, poured, and eaten word of Christ. This is what he will do. In Jesus' name, amen. Now the peace of God that passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord to life everlasting. Amen. We stand. And with joy and boldness we confess together, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, 
the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated as we gather our offering. stand to pray. Thank you. Lord, we thank you for the teaching of Jesus. He teaches us what he sends the Spirit to do, both a negative and a positive work, a work of convicting and exposing, but a work of guiding and glorifying you. We praise you for the work of the Spirit. We praise you for the word that he brings to us so that we might know Christ our Lord and in him be reconciled to you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We thank you for our graduates, those here today, those unable to be with us, those no longer in this area, but certainly blessed by Zion's ministry. We thank you also for our graduate who is in heaven with you, Max. We thank you for loving him, And we pray that you would comfort us in our sorrow to know that this sorrow is not permanent, only temporary, because of Christ our Lord. We pray your blessing to be and remain upon and the faith of Christ to remain in, in a living and vibrant way, in Haley, Olivia, Brooklyn, Kai, Araya, 
Tyler, Ross, Aaron, and Lang. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Lord, today we grieve with the Bexton family. We know their hearts have been touched by grief in a profound and painful way. We ask that you bring your word of comfort in Christ into their hearts in a meaningful way, that you would raise up your church to minister to them and continually bring this promise to them, that it may sustain them in their time of darkness. But remind them of the promise of Christ. He knows the way through the valley of the shadow of death, so we can trust him. Grant them this comfort and this confidence, and the same for all who grieve. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For Kristen Webb, Bruce Rutz, Steve Rutz, Athena Best, Cowie Jenkins, Gary Schrader, Jim Devers, Rick Spock, Justine Schwizo, Sherry Steffes, Karen DeBoth, Ron Bruce, Roger Weirden, Judy Reinke, Lynn Cruz, Donna Porter, Bobby Borkowski, Paula Willett. Grant them grace sufficient for each day. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our pastors and missionaries, especially Pastor Oliver, bless the work he is doing in Taiwan and continue to strengthen his confession of Christ. We pray also for our cross-cultural worker, Molly. Give her joy in confessing Christ and bless the words of confession that the Spirit may accompany those and create faith and sustain faith in those who hear. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our law enforcement and military men and women, we pray protection from harm, that you would strengthen them to serve with integrity and honor. For our preschool, as it breaks for the summer, that you would go with these children, that the love of Christ will remain in their hearts and in their families. We look forward to celebrating with our partner congregation, Trinity, as they prepare to welcome their pastor in a short time. And we pray for peace in our world, shattered by violence and injustice and war. Bring peace and bring it in Christ. These prayers we bring before you in the name of Jesus. At his command and invitation, we are bold to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Receive the blessing of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated as we sing our final uh, hit song. When we begin to recess and graduates begin to follow me out at that time, would you stand again in honor of our graduates? We sing our final song.
Show.